Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to our presentation on social well-being in the legal profession titled Fostering Social Well-Being in the Legal Community. My name is James Burke, and I'm the Program Assistant slash Resource Coordinator at NJ Lab, and I'll be your moderator for this session. We hope that everyone has heard of NJ Lab before, but for those who have not, the New Jersey Lawyer Assistance Program is a free and confidential resource assisting all NJ lawyers, judges, law students, and law graduates to achieve and maintain personal and professional well-being. On behalf of NJ Lab, we want to thank all the participants in attendance throughout this week and to all the moderators and speakers as well. Now, if you missed the last three days of presentations, you can always head over to our very own NJ Lab YouTube channel. And you can watch those presentations along with previous years while being in the Law Week presentations as well. So before we dive into our speakers' presentations, let's take a moment to understand the importance of social well-being. Social well-being refers to the quality of our relationships, interactions, and sense of belonging within our communities. It encompasses aspects such as support networks, meaningful connections, and a sense of belonging. In the legal profession, where demands can be high and stress levels can escalate, maintaining social well-being is critical. Having support networks and connections can help legal professionals navigate challenges, cope with stress, and maintain a healthy work-life balance. Whether it's through support groups, networking events, or simply spending time with colleagues and loved ones, prioritizing social well-being can lead to a greater job satisfaction, resilience, and overall well-being. Today, we have the privilege from hearing from three distinguished speakers who will share their insights and experiences on how social well-being impacts legal professionals' careers and personal lives. First, we have Eric Salzman, who will be presenting on strength and community, embracing social well-being in legal practice and support groups. Eric is a New Jersey attorney within, with over 16 years of legal experience. Since 2007, he has been dedicated to advocating for clients and providing legal expert guidance. Beyond his legal practice, Eric has made significant contributions to the recovery community for the past 20 years. Eric is also a licensed recovery coach and peer advocate, and he is now an attorney counselor for NJ Lab. He combines legal expertise with a compassionate approach to support NJ Lab clients on their journey to overall well being. Eric will share his personal journey and discuss the importance of social well being in the legal profession, drawing from his experiences with support groups such as LAP's very own men's special group and various LCL meetings. Next, we'll hear from Anthony James, whose presentation is titled Self Reliance The Unbeaten Path to Social Well Being. Anthony is the founder of Trap Law University, a dynamic social enterprise aimed at bridging the gap between legal knowledge and marginalized individuals. He will share insights into the innovative services offered by Trap Law University and how social well being has influenced his journey as a lawyer and entrepreneur. And lastly, we have Denise Prescott who will speak on recovery is a long road and is infinitely better with company. Ms. Prescott graduated from Antioch School of Law and was admitted to the Florida Bar in 1981. She served as an assistant public defender and was a solo practitioner at the law office of Denise Prescott in Jacksonville, Florida. Some of her notable litigation work was BGF versus Florida Star and Nipper versus Martinez. Ms. Prescott is now retired, but has been with NJLAP since 1995. She's a great friend of the program. We thank her so much for her support throughout the years. Denise, with an extensive legal background, will highlight the importance of social well-being in her overall life and legal career, and also attending NJ Lab's very own women's meeting that offers support and social connections as well. So without further ado, let's begin with our first speaker, Eric Salzman. So everyone, please join me in welcoming Eric. Hi, everyone. So as James said, my name is Eric Salzman. I now work at uh, NJ Lab as a attorney counselor. And um, before that, I really focused on uh, helping individuals that were struggling with issues pretty much relating to, to addiction. I have a history myself of uh, addiction and being in recovery. And it's really in that context that I learned the importance of connectivity. And, you know, to me, uh, I think, you know, social well-being is all about connectivity. It's about just realizing that it takes, it takes more than just my own resources to really, you know, get things accomplished and to be well-balanced in, in life as well as, you know, the legal community. I tried for many years to do things on my own. I tended to isolate and it really led to... The, the opposite of social well-being. I was lonely. It led to other type of um, behaviors to compensate for that, which ended up not really being in my best interest. So 
you know, really it was through um, the, the, the principles of recovery that I learned the importance of connectivity and just having a social life to make sure that I'm in balance with my professional life and also my recovery life. At one point, I felt that the recovery and the professional was enough. And then I started to realize there still was a void. So when I started to really understand the necessity for me to be involved with other people, it um, it, it kind of changed my, my my view and and the way I, I was doing things. And it led to just a, a better balance in my life. And the ways that I learned to do it was initially just like I said, through 12 step meetings. And then I realized that there's more to it than that, of course. So one of the things when I was in law school and I went to CUNY Law School, I graduated in 2004 and um, I started a, a 12 step program or a, not a program, 12 step meeting at the law school, which initially there were only two people that, that came. But then I realized uh, within a couple of weeks, we a lot of people were coming to, to the meeting and it wasn't because of any issues with addiction. It was, I, I realized that people needed the camaraderie, especially the first year law students that really like myself felt very alone, very isolated, away from an environment that I was comfortable in and having the opportunity just to share some of the feelings and the anxiety that I was experiencing with others that were going through the same thing made the law school experience just a lot easier. And um, and it's something that I took into the practice as well. And I noticed at first when I began practicing that a lot of the attorneys that I was working with, they, they also tended to isolate. They were very competitive, which I mean, it's part of the profession, and even in law school, we were quite competitive. But to take out that 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 feeling of of having to do everything alone made a big difference and made law school easier, like I mentioned. And it also just started to make my life easier and in turn my practice easier. And it just opened up a whole door to socializing in ways that I just never felt were important, you know, prior to this. So one of the things that I I was exposed to and I continue to go to was the, the LCL meetings. These are the Lawyers Concerned for Lawyers meeting that was, um, it actually came before the um, Lawyers Assistance Program from what I understand of the history, but it's something that continues now. And this is a meeting that has different groups throughout the state that meets, um, I go to the Montclair meeting, which is on Tuesday nights, and it's an hour of law professionals, whether it's law students, law graduates, attorneys, judges, anyone in the legal profession is welcome to come. And we get to really share some of the experiences that we have in common that can lead to uh, stress. And it, it's just a, a way to identify with others and to just feel more part of a community instead of so isolated. And now we, um, we've taken that further as well. We have different, I mean, now through New Jersey Lawyers Assistance Program, there are support groups, there are men's meetings, there are, we, we do, um, there's, there's referrals as well. So if somebody within the legal community is struggling with any uh, type of emotional anxiety or just, just any feelings that they're really not understanding how to process, we, we have ways to, 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 to help understand that you're not alone. And I guess, again, you know, I'm, I'm kind of rambling a bit and I apologize for that, but it really comes down to this, this same concept, which is connectivity. And without that, the tendency to isolate and have all the negative consequences associated with that um, really just dissipate. So again, the importance of the meetings I can't stress enough. And um, I think the other thing that I need to mention, because I've recently learned that a lot of people within the New Jersey legal community believe that if you participate in any of the um, New Jersey Lawyers Assistance Program's different um, groups, that we keep a record and that somehow the uh, the state is aware of it and it becomes a mark on your, 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 your legal, um, your, your record somehow with the state. And I can't stress enough how that is just not accurate. We are confidential. Anybody that contacts us is has to be able to know and rest assured that we don't share that information with anybody unless you authorize us to do that. 
And I think that makes a big difference. Knowing that opens the door for people to participate where in the past they might have been afraid to. So I guess the most important thing to take away from this is to remember that if you try to do everything alone, it's just too much stress. It's not necessary. And to try to just get involved in some type of activity that will help balance your life. And um, it just, it, it's made such a, a difference in, in, in my life that I hope people understand that it can make a difference in theirs as well. Again, we have a website and um, the njlap.org. If you come there to visit the website, you'll see that we have um, different groups that we offer and different resources. And, you know, come visit the website. We have a, um, a monthly publication as well called Balance, which addresses those issues as well as others that pertain to the legal community and having a balanced life. And, you know, again, I'll say that this week of well-being in the law is an excellent concept, but my concern is always that when it's considered a week that people tend to forget about it for the other 51 weeks of the year. And it's important that this is an ongoing concern and that we all participate in you know, a well-being program every week of the year. Um, I believe that's my time now and um i guess we'll move to the next speaker there's going to be questions at the end and um i'll be happy to um answer any questions anyone has all right thank you very much thanks james awesome no thank you eric thank you for sharing your valuable insights so now well, let's hear from anthony james let's please welcome anthony Hello, everyone. Hello. I'm so sorry for this. We're trying to get Anthony up to the microphone and we'll be uh, getting him up shortly. Hello? Hey, Anthony. Um, you're you're up if you're feeling ready, ready to go. Can you, can anybody hear me? Yep, we can hear you. Okay, all right. Um, so I was you gotta gotta forgive me. Uh, in court, I'm running out now. Just give me one second. I was also under the impression that uh this was happening at four o'clock. I didn't know I was supposed to. Get my presentation out. So, Whew. all right. Okay, you guys still hear me? Yep, still hear you. All right. Okay. So, <laughs> forgive me. Um, first and foremost, my name is Anthony James. Uh, I affectionately go by the name of the trap lawyer. Um. First and foremost, I want to thank you guys for having me. It's an honor to be here, uh, to be able to tell my story and share my purpose with this platform uh, in a land where time is our greatest currency and our greatest asset. I don't take attention lightly, so I wanted to start off by giving thanks. Thank you, James. All right, um, so let's rewind a little bit. Uh, I want to take you guys back a little bit. Uh, Oakland City College, 1959, all right? A young black man from the inner city of Oakland Impoverished, he was filled with hope, fear of the unknown, but a deep hunger to feed his curiosity. Um, it was clear that he was black, right? America has a funny way of not allowing you to forget those kind of things. Um, things like who you are and how society should feel about those type of people. Uh, inquisitive, yet unaimed, he was searching for, uh, well, what we all search for at one time in our lives. Um, possibly multiple times, a uh, purpose. Uh, so he set off in his studies, sociology, 
uh, the study of people and how they interact, uh, psychology, the study of the mind, cultural anthropology, all of the ology, <laughs> right? Um, but because of, uh, but, I mean, excuse me, but through all of the beautiful philosophies and concepts and areas of study is open to him. Hold on, I'm getting a, a link here. Do, okay, so do I join as a panelist? Is that what you... I'm sorry, Anthony, we cannot see you bec because you came in as a guest and we promoted you to panelists, so we should be able to see you. There you are. Okay, now we can't hear you, so we need you to. Um, okay. There you, you go. All right. Uh, Good see? job. We're getting this together. You would think I use this every day for court. You would think I'd be a master of it by now. Oh, uh, but obviously that's not the case. Okay, so I'm not exactly sure what you guys heard of. Should I start over or what do we? Can, we you can, did you hear can feel you. We, we're good. Yeah, you, we're good. Okay. All right. So I'll, I'll start from where I, where I ended. Okay, but of all of the uh, beautiful philosophies and concepts uh, open to him in his areas of study, the greatest gift that he received was his ability to uh, comprehend the universe around him to feel that he himself could develop answers that best suited his own experience. Um, that may be uh, the high school teachers or the neighborhood adults that told him that he wasn't uh, college material. Maybe those people were wrong. Um, I mean, after all, only he would know what was actually going on in those rooms between him and his books, right? The things that his mind began to perceive. Uh, he was learning. That he was learning well. In fact, so much so that his uh, normal course of studies began to disappoint him because uh, there was nothing in school that related to the conditions of the people that he knew, that he grew up around, of the brothers that were on the block, of people like him uh, from where he was from. Uh, he likened it to a urban plantation of sorts, right? Kind of a modern day share copy. Um, where you worked hard, you bought in your crop, but you were almost always perpetually um, in debt with the landlord or with stores who provided the necessities of life. Uh, he reasoned too. He reasoned that they too, though they were physically free, um, were in a prison and needed to be liberated in order to, you know, distinguish the truth. Um, question, uh, James. Yes. But, um, really quick, I'm, my apology. I know we. Yeah, you're good. All right. Are, are we doing this again at four, or is this the. This, this is right now, yeah. This is right now. Okay. All yeah. right. Cool. All right. We're still with me. All right. So he reasoned that though they were physically free, um, they were in a prison and needed to be liberated in order to distinguish between the truth and the falsehood that were imposing them through, throughout the generations. All right. Um, but because of this, he was able to champion a concept that uh, had a very profound impact on me as a young man. Um, the idea of combining uh, the world of the streets and the world of a scholar, right? Uh, reaching people with ideas, with programs, with initiatives that spoke to their condition. Um, at the same time of identifying the root of their condition without causing, without pointing blame, um, and not just provide an education, but a mental framework that was applicable to all the areas in their life, right? Uh, because we know as professionals, everyone in here, how you do anything is how you do everything. Now, I love to tell this story, right? I love it mostly because uh, people generally have a hard time differentiating if I am talking about myself or if I'm talking about someone else. <laughs> uh, even though I start the story off in the 1950s, uh, people still think I'm I'm Benjamin Button or uh, in that nature. Uh, but I tell it today because it accurately depicts uh, the unbeaten path that's the subject of what I want to present to you today. The idea that uh, self-reliance is almost always a highway that exits at social well-being. All right. 
Uh, by the way, the man I was speaking of, the young man I was speaking of, will later go on to be Huey P. Newton, uh, the co-founder of the Black Panther Party. Uh, but before I get into what me and my company do, uh, I want to take time to uh, define some terms so we're all on the same page. I realize that it means nothing to speak or to hear unless the speaker and the hearer both have uh, an understanding of language, right? So just, just a series of questions as we go through. So what is self-reliant? Well, Webster's Dictionary uh, excuse me, defines self-reliance as having confidence in and exercising one's own powers of judgment, uh, uh, or excuse me, one owns power or judgment, right? I like this definition. Uh, it's firm, it's strong, it gives a good understanding. Uh, but I found another one that was given by a church, a Protestant church. Um, uh, it's defined as, self-reliance is defined as the ability, commitment, and effort to provide spiritual and worldly necessities of life for self and for family. Now, I know that's, the, that's, that's a mouthful, so I'm going to try to break it down and be as fast as possible. I know the definitions aren't really um, our, uh, we, we do enough definitions all day, right? Um, <laughs> so now I want to, I love this definition, though, because it shows the intersectionalities of self-reliance, and its importance uh, because it's applicable and beneficial to almost every area of our existence, right? The word ability in the definition speaks to the fact that self-reliance can be taught. It's something that can be learned, it can be cultivated. Commitment speaks to the heart posture one takes to uh, be self-reliant. It's not a one-time thing, it's a dedication. As the old folks uh, growing up would say, uh, you gotta have some gumption about yourself if you will. Um, and lastly, effort, right? Because this is an active process and it will take work uh, and it is a process, right? But the next part of the definition is where the magic is, right? To provide this for the spiritual and worldly necessities of life and self, I mean, of life for self and family, right? The idea that self-reliance is a tool for advancement in both your worldly and spiritual life is all encompassing. It means that we have to play an active role and we get to play an active role in who we become, what we do with this borrowed time that we've been given, um, how our actions cont uh, contribute to society and those that we care for. All right, uh, social well-being, which is the the uh, the reason why we're all gathered here today. Uh, social well-being is the building and maintaining of healthy relationships having meaningful and authentic interactions with others. Ladies and gentlemen, my presentation before you today is going to belabor that point over and over. Uh, that authentic relationships or authentic re uh, interactions are the cornerstone of social well-being, right? But that authenticity, uh, authenticity, excuse me, can also, it seems like a simple concept, uh, but it's also harder than just be yourself, the phrase we all always hear, be yourself, all right? In a world that champions assimilation and groupthink, authenticity can also um, almost become a verb. It's a journey, right? A journey that many are afforded the time and space to truly like divulge in. So the overarching question here becomes, well, how can something that you do for yourself be beneficial or lead to social well-being, right? Most of you have probably all heard these sayings that um, uh, these things as they relate to you, you know, your moral interactions with others, and they go uh, do unto others that you would do unto yourself, right? Love one another as you would love yourself. These commands and and are, have become moral staples for us that delve into you know principles of social well-being, but with a caveat. The caveat is, as you would yourself. Well, and that begs the question, uh, how do you treat yourself? You know, maybe I don't want you to treat me how you would treat yourself, right? Uh, maybe you're not too nice to yourself. Maybe you don't uh, build and uplift yourself. Maybe you don't really have too many nice things to ever say about yourself. As a matter of fact, uh, uh, treat me how you would treat your cat. <laughs> right, you, you you love that cat. I know you love that cat. Treat, you treat me that way, right? But 
I, I say that to say the fact that I, I would argue that it's nearly impossible to genuinely do something for another person that you won't do for yourself. And genuine is important because it denotes authenticity, as we spoke about before. Is this who you are? All right. Now, I admit on the offset that these two words um, seem independent of each other. Uh, self, social, right? Um, and almost opposites, if you will. But the connection rests in the idea that we owe not only a duty to ourselves, but to others to continually develop ourselves to take an intentional and active role uh, in our personal development, in our authenticity, and then share that with the world in a way that edifies, with, in a way that advances, in a way that adds values, uh, adds value to others. Excuse me. Which brings me to what we do. All right, me and the good folks over at Trap Law University um, and how what we do fosters both uh, self-reliance and social well-being. Um, while also creating self-reliant people who go on to foster so, uh, social well-being in their own authentic way. And I think that's one of the most important things, seeds that grow and plant other seeds. Um, what is Trap Law University? I'm glad you asked. <laughs> All right. Trap Law University is a social enterprise committed to the democratization of legal education. All right. We're dedicated to bridging gaps between legal knowledge and marginalized individuals who lack access to traditional resources. All right. We recognize that, you know, urban and underprivileged communities face different and often unique challenges as it comes to understanding and navigating the legal system. All right. The, um, and through our comprehensive services, we strive to empower those individuals. Uh, with knowledge and resources necessary to protect their rights, to engage with the legal system, but most important, to advocate for themselves and their community. Um, it's a sense of belonging that makes people feel as though they belong to a society and that society belongs to them. It gives them a sense of obligation that I have to make this a better place for me to live. Uh, and that's the most important. It's, it's a... Uh, I'm not sure if you all have seen the movie Inception, right? But we can't just uh, give an idea. You have to plan it. It has to feel like it's coming from yourself. Right? I love that movie. Forgive me. Okay. So what do we offer? All right. At TLU, we believe in making legal education accessible. Okay. So I produce high quality legal content in various formats. That includes videos, infographics, articles, podcasts, social media content. We're everywhere. We go directly to the source, wherever the people are, all right? And we speak to them in a language that they can understand uh, with a delivery that's easily, uh, that can be easy to digest, right? We have a formula here at Trap Law University that I, I, I will, you know, pat my own back at the week. <laughs> I like to say that I invented, right? Uh, short, impactful, easy to consume, repeat. Short, impactful, easy to consume, repeat. As an educator for 50 years in North New Jersey, my grandmother would always say to me, uh, if you can't explain it simply, then you don't understand it. All right, I took that to heart. I take that to heart now and I'll make sure that that's our mission. Um, this is the candy coated vegetable method. All right, we put medicine in the candy and we push it out in high volumes. All right, it's non intimidating and we have levels, right? So to deepen our impact of our educational efforts, um, TLU, Trap Law University, offers legal courses that provide in-depth knowledge, uh, excuse me, in-depth knowledge on specific areas of legal, legal topics, uh, civics, contracts, uh, family law, criminal law, Fourth Amendment. Um, we, we dive a little bit into specifics, but we give a broad and overview of how to analyze and read the law. And I think that's major. And the biggest thing, of course, is um, catering to diverse learning styles. When I was in law school, um, lectures didn't do it for me, right? I, I used to uh, block out the library, the whiteboard room on time and in, and I'd have to draw little stick figures, right? Um, I changed the names. Johnny, Susie, and, and Jerry didn't relate to me. Uh, shout out to all of the Johnny, Susies, and Jerry's in the world. I love you, all right? But they, they didn't relate to me. So I, I, I had to make it stick with me. And it became a part of uh, a process that became easier to understand, right? So 
Um, also, our podcast, right? Our podcast serves as an engaging platform to discuss legal uh, uh, issues. Uh, we use hip hop, entertainment, other current events as our topics that engage. Uh, but more than just knowledge, the tools that we offer are designed to help people to begin to think in a way that encourages individual autonomy, independence, which I believe are fundamental to human dignity uh, at its core, right? When, when people feel confident in their ability to take care of themselves and their challenges, they're more likely to navigate life's ups and downs effectively, um, to contribute to an overall social stability, if you will. Um, individuals who have the freedom to make their own choices understand uh, how to discern the right ones for themselves and have the option to pursue their own goals, they're more likely to experience fulfillment, right? And satisfaction in their life. Um, Self-reliant individuals often contribute positively to the communities. Um, they may volunteer their time or their resources. That fosters a social cohesion and solidarity. Uh, individuals who are self-reliant are more likely to be productive members of the workforce, right? This promotes uh, uh, entrepreneurship and innovation. Uh, but above all else, above all else, a society where individuals are self-reliant is less susceptible to issues that, uh, that rely on dependency, right? Such as social inequality, exploitation, uh, marginalization, uh, by encouraging people to be self-sufficient, uh, societies can work towards creating a more equitable and inclusive environment for all its members. And I think that's that's what social well-being is all about, right? Uh, giving, receiving an equal measure uh, and treating everyone with uh, the dignity of a human being, knowing that we all go through the same issues. Uh, ups, downs, highs, lows, at its core, at its being, what it means to be a human being is dependent on uh, social well-being. That's my time. I, I appreciate the floor. Thank you. Uh, th thank you so much, Anthony, for that enlightening presentation. Um, exactly. We're going to try to post your the website, uh, the link to uh, the yes. chat. So if anyone uh, wants to take a look while we're presenting or afterwards, you know, feel free. Please. Thank you. No problem. Thank you. So our final oh. speaker today is Denise Prescott. So let's give a warm welcome to Denise. Thank you again. Uh, thank you. Okay, so I'm going to come at um, wellness from a different point of view. Um, I, um, I was practicing in Florida and um, probably noticing that you know, that I was under a great deal of stress. Um, and kept telling myself, okay, I'll, you know, yeah, I'll, t I'll take a break, I'll pay some attention to myself, I will. Well, and you know, the thing is, is you can promise your body, promise your mind this as much as you want to, but at some point your mind just says, Okay, I'm going on vacation without you. So that's the experience that I had. I was in private practice and holding on very well until my, my daughter went off to college. And um, then it seemed like um, I wasn't holding it together quite as well. So I had made a promise to myself. Um, the promise was that if I ever decided that I wanted to commit suicide, I would make a phone call to the suicide hotline before I did this. Um, because I thought that, you know, if you're gonna do something that drastic, then you know, the preparation sort of requires that you do your due diligence and call someone. Well, I did, and um, 
you know, the woman who answered the phone at the suicide hotline said, honey, did you lose your job? And so I said, no, I, I didn't lose my job, I'm still working. And she said, oh, well, is it your husband? I said, no, I don't have one of those. Um, and she said, you, ch you, have, you have children. I said, yes, I have a child. Well, is that the problem, your child? And so I said, no. And she said, well, if it's not your job, your husband or your child, what's wrong with you? <laughs> and that was when I decided that <clears throat> I um, needed to talk to somebody else. I could not let my last conversation on earth be that conversation. Um, so I asked her if there was somebody else there that I could speak to besides her. And I talked to them and I realized as I was talking to them, I said, now, you know, what you're doing is admitting that you are not mentally well. And um, there is the possibility that these people may be looking to institutionalize you. But being a good lawyer, of course, <clears throat> Once you realize these things, you know you can talk your way out of anything. And so when the other person got on the phone, you know, I was properly one of those people who said, who was put off the no, they don't have to come to my house and visit me. Um, yes, I would happily um, come in and see someone and, um, you know, dodge the bullet. <clears throat> Uh, you know, I, I, you get a little bit of strength and you continue. And at some point I went to a women lawyers group and I said, you know, what do you do about burnout? And they said, girl, that's when you call in your girlfriends and you meet with them every lunch and you talk to them and they let them talk you through this. I said, okay. But the practice of law is kind of a lonely, um, it's, a, it's isolating. When you practice law, you are very much aware of the image that you present to others, especially when you're not in private practice. Um, so that um, you, where you go out, to dance or to drink or to party, um, you sort of limit yourself because you want to make sure that you're in the company that is not going to, to hold it against you. Um, That said, depression by itself is also one of those things that is also isolating. And so for that matter <coughs> is alcoholism, because as I'm understanding from the people that I've spent time with, um, it's one thing to be drinking and be the life of the party. And it's another thing to, um, face yourself. And so the overriding thing that I think that as an attorney, you have to counteract is shame. And shame, unfortunately, it's like inflammation. Um, it arises because of the circumstances, but it doesn't really do anything good for you. Um, so, I felt myself slipping. Um, and finally, one day I just crashed and burned. My mind went on vacation without me. And um, my fellow members of the bar um, 
came in, gathered around me and um, I was declared medically inactive with a diagnosis of major depression. Um, at the time, there was um, a lawyer's assistance program in the state of Florida, but that lawyer's assistance program was just dealing with expanding itself from alcoholism to people who had drug-related problems. Um, and they were now being asked to include people with mental health problems like depression. They were wholly unprepared for it. Um, the state of Florida is a very long state. Um, they had an in-person group in Miami and um, pretty much if you were any place too far to attend, um, their idea was that you um, contact the lawyer's assistance program on a, I forget whether it's a weekly or a monthly basis and you um, let them know that yes, you're seeing whoever it is, the therapist or whoever it is you're supposed to be seeing when you're taking your medication. And that was it. Um, well, um, because of my situation, I could no longer practice. Um, my dad came up, took a look at me, my brother came down and they packed me up, put me in a car and brought me back to New York where, where I'm from originally. Um, and when I got here, I looked to get in contact with the lawyer's assistance program here because um, I wanted to continue the obligation that I started in Florida. New York at the time had nothing going on for um, people who had depression problems. And New Jersey was just starting. And as a result, I'm a Florida lawyer who's never practiced in New York or New Jersey. And, but New Jersey was kind enough to open the door for me. And I've been appreciating it ever since. Um, what I found when I got to um, New Jersey was that there were people that I could meet with, that I could talk to, that also shared, um, you know, my problem, which is being a lawyer and being impaired. Um, I didn't get the kind of crazy reactions that I got from non-lawyer people. When I came to New York, I. I interacted with a social worker who said to me, you girl, you don't want to take those pills. What you need is God in your life. And you need this book. This book, and I recommend it. It's called 47 Devils Came Out of Me. And um, it was kind of a variation on, on a lot of what I heard from, from non-lawyers, people who were more, more likely to believe that um, you were just sad, that you would get over it, that, um, that you would actually give up your practice for something that you know, was gonna go away eventually. And um, so I needed to be in the company of people who understood exactly what it was that I was going through. People who would understand the shame that came with being a professional who could no longer cope. And that is what New Jersey Bar Association offered to me it was a group of people that I could meet with. At the time we were meeting once a month, 
And um, on most of those months, we would check in with each other. But from time to time, we would have a professional in who would talk to us about <clears throat> various things connected to our impairment. Um, and I found that this group was a lifeline for me. Now, eventually, the um, New Jersey Bar Association, the LAP, excuse me, put together um, the women with uh, mental health problems with the women who had alcohol and drug and, and um, gambling problems. And I was a little bit concerned about that because when I heard from the people with alcohol problems, they seemed like once they stopped drinking, that they had reached a platform from which they, um, you know, were fairly steady. And the people with mental health problems seemed to be a bit more fragile. Um, the good thing about it was that um, we meshed. We understood the, the important things that we needed to understand were that um, whatever it was that caused our impairment, we were essentially the same and we needed each other because we needed people who understood what it was that we were going through. We needed people who um, we could open up with and be honest. And um, really there were, there were times when I would be counting the days till the next meeting. Um, now that, I joined LAP in 95. I still attend. And I still attend because of the support that I received. At one point, I even left New York and went to Providence, Rhode Island to work. Um, and I called the Rhode Island Bar Association to see what their LAP was like and the services that they had available to people with mental health problems were, um, we can refer you to a therapist. But there was no um, group. Um, so I just made it my business to show up every month in New Jersey, just driving from, from um, Providence. And um, I'm really grateful for the, you know, for the um, camaraderie and for the blessing that has been extended to me by New Jersey Law, um, Lawyers Assistance Program. Now, um, by attending, I think I'm probably one of the older members and I'm in a position to share with people who come in, the newcomers who have their problems um, because I'm familiar with the landscape and I can talk to people and and understand what it is that they're feeling. I can explain um, the way the way things look and what they can expect as they go down the road towards recovery. And um, mostly, um, this is enough, even till today. I was talking to my psychiatrist because I'm sort of between therapists at the time. And he said, Denise, um, how are you getting by in the interim? And I told him, New Jersey Lawyers Assistance Program. So thank you for the opportunity for, to have me share with you um, the blessing that I've received. And um, I hope that if you're ever in need of it, that you'll find your way over. Thank you. Thank you, Denise. That was, thank you for that powerful, moving, inspiring story. Yeah, uh, we 
we here at NJ Lab value your our relationship with each other, that social connection that we have, that something that will last a lifetime for sure. So thank you so much. Um, so for now, we'll open the floor for some questions. If you guys have any questions in the in the chat, feel free to write them down. But in the meantime, I, I have some questions for our speakers. So if our speakers want to, um, you know, pop their video back open, and I'll ask you guys some questions. So the first question, first question I want to ask is, how do you guys prioritize social well-being in your daily routine, especially during busy periods? Eric, do you want to speak on that? Sure, I'm happy. Saying? Absolutely. You know, uh, it's really what I was discussing earlier. It's mm -hmm. something that you know I I kind of worked it into my my life schedule is to make sure that I attend you know different support groups and including the uh, Lawyers Conservative Lawyers meeting that I, I try to attend regularly. And, um, you know, what I realized is by doing it on a regular basis, it, it, I'm ready when I need it. I know where to go. So when things get, you know, a little overwhelming and I, I start feeling the stress and anxiety associated with, you know, my profession, I know where I can go to to discuss these things, to, to, to vent in a way, and to just to talk to other people that are experiencing the same thing. And that's what I found is most important, is to kind of have it like muscle memory. So when things start getting a little stressful, I know where to go. I know what to do. I've learned it, you know, from trial and error, uh, unfortunately, more error than success. But um, now I've learned that, you know, ask for help, reach out um, any way that you can, really. So for me, I have my 12 step groups that I, I, I participate in. I still go to group therapy that I've been attending for over a decade now, really. And um, and again, I just keep um, people close and I try to remember that um it's all right to ask for help. Thank you so much, Eric. Mm -hmm. Our next question. What advice would you give to legal professionals who may be struggling to maintain social connections or find support networks? Denise, would you like to answer that? Yeah. And, and the answer to it is ask around and don't accept just the first answer that you get continue to ask. Um, I failed to mention when I was talking the importance of LCL groups, because I do attend a weekly Lawyers Caring for Lawyers group. And that is another one of those mainstays that allows me to stay present and connected. And um, there's, um, there's, there's research that says that um, people who are depressed um, are actually sensitive to um, acceptance, more, ex more sensitive to acceptance and to rejection than most people. And so um, that being the case, filling up on acceptance is really, really important. Great answer. Thank you, Denise. Um, for the last question, how do you see the future of social well-being initiatives evolving within the legal profession? Anthony, would you like to comment? Um, I think um, I might not be as qualified to answer that question as uh, the two uh, presenters. I'm still at the early stages of uh, just being able to, you know, mm -hmm. seek help and uh you know find people who are you know like me i've i've delved uh deep into my passions and my passions have afforded me the ability to meet people and come across you know different um walks of life and understanding uh but i still sometimes you know in that in that capacity i'm still serving um and so the i'm so sorry one second Pretty good. Right. Forgive me, guys. In that capacity, I'm still a servant, so I do struggle sometimes with feeling like uh, maybe I'm not quite being un as understood as I as I would like. Um, yeah, we could. Uh, um, 
So yeah, I'm I'm, I'm still developing in that area, if you will. Um, but I would say uh, my passion, my passions have been a really good uh, door into um, the community, and you know, not being by myself all the time. Uh, this the piggyback off of what and I know it's, it's not on topic, but the piggyback went off of, of what Eric was saying uh, when he first started his pre presentation. Uh, law school really does do a number on you um, mentally, man. It does uh, because there is a lot of comparison. Just the idea that how successful I am is compared to how successful somebody else is. Already, I'm at odds with the people around me. You know what I mean? It's like. I don't want you to fail, but I don't want you to do better than me, you know, because I could be out of here <laughs> really quick. And that creates a super hyper competitive, hyper comparison, hyper, uh, you just become aware of things about yourself that you weren't. And it's easy to find fault to yourself and, and you know, detrimental. And so so I, I truly believe we do. Anybody who's going to law school needs a circle. I, I don't care if you think you have a, a mental health issue or not, um, it, it has created something in you that we need to we need to address. So I I, I appreciate uh, hearing you, uh, Eric, on that topic. Thank you for your answer, Anthony. And uh, something that NJ Lap offers is a student a law student support group. Uh, we just recently started. It's probably about going to be around a year now. So we're uh, we're starting that up again, and um, it's a great great service to have here. Absolutely, mm -hmm. absolutely. I'm glad you guys do have. And also, uh, Anthony's wearing some of his Trap Law University gear. I can see his oh. clothing there. So if <laughs> yeah, you guys yeah. go to the go to his website, he has some clothing. I just bought a shirt recently, so I'm uh, should be in the Thank mail you. today. So can't wait to can't wait to represent that and you know form more social connections throughout the community. Well, just by wearing that shirt, people can come up and ask me, "Oh, you know, where'd you get that shirt?" And I can just have a social connection, talk to someone. You know. Amen. Amen. Absolutely. So I'll so be you, looking for um you're gonna give me some merch, right? Anthony, you're gonna oh, send absolutely. me some merch. All right, good. For, for sure. I would love, I would love to. I would love to, man. But let so me just you, say no? real quickly, it, you know, it, it starts at law school. You know, the, the whole atmosphere in law school is so cutthroat. You know, I remember at one time we all had the same assignment and somebody took the pages right out of the book. So no yes. one else would use it but them. And yes. it's something that needs to get changed on that level first, and then hopefully it can down or trickle up into the actual legal uh, profession. So hopefully we can uh, implement some changes here. And, and, and it's, and I'm sorry, because no. it's so relevant in your mind, but you, and you think that that level of uh, a comparison or competitiveness is necessary to be a lawyer, but, but it really just, it really eats you up it, uh, once you start to come into the profession, once I've gotten out of the Oh, I'm looking to become a lawyer. I remember when I finally became a lawyer, I didn't even really know how to celebrate the moment uh, mm. because of everything it took me to get there. I was just like so beaten down. I was like, okay, I need help now. <laughs> I, need, I need somebody to talk to about all the stuff I had to do to get here, man. Uh, and so, yeah, that's it's, it's very, very important. I want to thank you guys so much. So as we conclude today's presentation, I want to express our gratitude to our speakers and sharing their expertise and experiences with us. Remember, prioritizing social well-being is essential for fulfilling a legal career and overall better quality of life. So I want to thank everyone in attendance. We hope you enjoyed our presentation and the previous well-being presentations during this week as well. Remember to check out the previous well-being presentations on our YouTube page. Just type in youtube.com slash at symbol NJLAP. And if you have any concerns on your well-being or if you're interested in the meetings that we have to promote, Head over, head over to our website, www.njlap.org. Or can you please give us a call at 1-800-246-5527 or shoot me an email at james at njlap.org. So have a wonderful rest of your day, everyone. Thank you.